Hello, welcome to The Life After. I'm Chuck Parson. And I'm Brady Harden. We've got a very special episode for you today. Yeah, we're pretty excited about this one. Um, We say this every time, but I really, really, (laughs) really mean it this time. (laughs) Right, Um, right. We're really serious this time. Well, because it's important, it has to do with the history of our our podcast. One of the things that aligned up for our show to start was Jamie Lee Finch posted on her Facebook an article on... Um, religious, religious trauma, trauma syndrome. Syndrome. syndrome yeah so uh and i read that and it was written by dr marlene winnell who is our guest today yeah uh yeah so yeah really excited about i mean this is like it's i think it's safe to say this podcast wouldn't exist without marlene's work is mm. that or, or some or it'd be a totally different thing right i yeah i completely agree yeah. cool um well hey marlene yeah hey. welcome to the show <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Welcome to the show. Yeah. Thank uh, you. Um Thanks. where where are you located? Where are you at? I am in the Bay Area in California. Ooh cool. nice. Yep. Tell us uh let's just you know what, let's just take the next hour and can you describe the weather in, in <laughs> detail? Because we're we're in St. Louis. Well today and... it was rainy and awful. Uh, okay. Uh, right. okay. Well, we can relate with that. It wasn't then. too bad here, I guess. <laughs> we could relate with that. <laughs> um so just to give everybody kind of a an idea, um um Marlene coined the phrase um religious trauma, religious syndrome, trauma syndrome, syndrome. syndrome. Um mm-hmm. and has been a pioneer of it since then. Um she has an organization called Journey Free, um, which is uh, to s- sort of help uh, people find their way out of religion in a in a safer way, or, or help uh, with the out process. of dogmatic religion, and out of dogmatic har- religion, religion, right? Religion, yeah. yeah, yeah, toxic religion. Um, and uh, through Journey Free, you have some retreats coming up, right? Is that uh huh? So you, uh, what is that? Give me a, give me a uh, the cliff notes on what a retreat looks like, because I feel like. By saying the word retreat might be kind of scary for a lot of our listeners, <laughs> right? But but this is a uh, this is not uh, the kind of retreat that we grew up going to, right? Oh, you mean the, like a religious retreat? Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. No, it's not like that at all. <laughs> um, this is an unretreat. Okay. Good. <laughs> oh, I like that. <laughs> cool. Um, it's three days together with about twelve people that have also left their religion. It might be. Christianity, in fact, mostly evangelical Christianity. Okay. Um, but it could be people from other other groups like um, Mormonism or Jehovah's Witness sure. um, or others. And mm-hmm. we spend the weekend together telling our stories and doing exercises that are geared towards healing. And, and then uh, we just um, share all these processes mm-hmm. that um, contribute to... Um, the healing process that can take a long time, but somehow just spending this this weekend together seems to seems to be a um, a jump ahead for people. Oh, right. Right. It's up. Awesome. It just um, it accelerates the process hmm. because you find out that you're not alone, and that's a very right. very big. Thing. Just listening to everybody else's stories is is a big part of it. That's Very been cool. a big part of our show. Um, I try to do a lot of the emails and the messages that we get from fans. And one phrase that always came up was that they thought they were the only ones going through this. So there's uh-huh. kind of like an isolating part about RTS. Um, what have you noticed about that? What are some of the things that we can learn? Well, um, in a way, there's sort of a phobia about talking about it because you've been taught all the to- all along that if you have any problems, that it's your fault. Hmm. Right. And right. so um, even after you've left the religion, everything everything that if you have any problems, like with your job or getting an apartment or getting into a car accident or whatever, it's your fault. You you, you brought it on yourself. Right, 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 right. Or, or um, the Holy Spirit is trying to bring you back to God. Right, 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 right. Well, just this, this idea of agency, mm-hmm. you know, where... Where is it coming from? Like, are, are you in charge of your life or are you just um, a pawn of, of forces? And um, is God just trying to get you back? Um, so you don't want to talk about it. And, you, and it's also embarrassing. People don't want to, don't want to uh, sound like they've been in a cult and then they're too weird uh, for other people to take seriously. Right, 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 right. And then if everybody's being quiet about it, it does seem like you're alone. And actually, that's not true. You're far from alone. 
Yeah. But but people are being very quiet about it because mm. as it is, it, it tends to be embarrassing, and you, and you tend to think that you're supposed to handle it on your own. Mm. That was a big step for me. I think I was what you mentioned about uh, something happening and then thinking that it's God trying to bring you back to the religion or something. I had a fear when I was leaving the religion that I would go through a hardship uh, physically, you know, whether it's health or like a car accident or something, because I, I knew that the first response of so much of my family would be. Oh, this is God trying to bring you back. Right. right you know, right. and so that it was kind of like a fear of mine of having to come face to face with something like that if I get into a difficult time again, you know? Yeah, I, I you described it uh I'm not sure, maybe in one of your essays as a as sort of like a so fundamentalism sort of demands a power structure that has to be enforced, right? So um so you have like you have God at the top and the then you umbrella, have clergy and then yeah. you have sort of everyone else or you have men usually under clergy uh, and then you have everyone else and, and, and you're sort of expected to adhere to that. So you have this, uh, this system where God, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm really tired. It's been a very trying week. Um, I'm going to edit this out. Um, well, so you have I understand what you're saying. You yeah, have yeah. this hierarchy, and and under clergy, you have um, fathers as head of household, and then women are under that. Right. It's women and then children. So uh, you do have this structure, and so you have to obey. The biggest thing is that you obey authority. You're not supposed to think for yourself. And if you think for yourself, that's actually dangerous. It's wrong and dangerous to think for yourself because you could – be led astray. Right. You, you could be deceived by the devil. Right. So over and o over and over again, you're taught that your own thoughts and feelings are wrong and dangerous. And so when you get out, um, you have a lot of work to do to learn how to think for yourself and trust your own feelings. One of the things I say all uh, pretty frequently is, if you when you learn to trust yourself, you'll learn you'll know how to live. Right. Mm. Oh wow. That's like yeah. That. That's great. Yeah, um, and I guess that's sort of, I guess the, the point I was trying to make was that, like, in terms of that fear, right, of of leaving that something is going to happen when you leave, that's all part of the the rhetoric that's used to, to force people to stay, right? Brady was afraid of something happening because he knew how the people would, you know, people in his life would respond, but before that, you were afraid to leave because you thought there was nothing out there or that it was worse or that you would mm. some kind of harm would come right. to you, if not like fear of hell, right? Right. Well, we were we were very. I was very much a Calvinist, and so we had such an emphasis on total depravity. So having this idea that everybody within our little religious bunker were people that we can trust, and then anybody outside of that bunker kind of were the bad people or the ones that um, every inclination of their hearts, you know, is turned towards sin. So we had a very uh, messed up idea of what the real world was going to be like. Um, and it kind of scared me in a way to stay in for a while. But once I got out and had that bravery, I realized... Um, um, no, that isn't reflective of reality or how people really are, you know, that was helpful well, for me. The world is the domain of Satan. Right, mm. right, yes. right, right. So if you're not, God, a, yeah. Or Sa Satan rules the world because it's, it's his time, right? This is the era of uh, Satan's rule and, and God will win in the end. But for now, it's the fallen world mm. yeah. and very dangerous. And so if you leave... If you leave the group, if you leave the safety of, of the, the fellowship of the, the Christian group, then you're putting yourself in great danger. Mm, so, right. you're, so you're afraid of hell, but you're afraid of, of life right now. Mm -hmm. One mm -hmm. uh, thing that you touch a lot in your book, um, Leaving the Fold, which is... Ugh. Right, yeah. I mean, if, you, if you're listening to this show and you haven't read the book, it's... Just like, turn the podcast like, off. <laughs> Just get out of here. Right. Go get, go get Stop a... listening to us and start reading Marlene's book. Right. It's called Leaving the Fold, just to, in case that wasn't super um, clear. Leaving the Fold was so helpful for me of seeing kind of what it was that got me 
included into the religion, like what it was about my personality that clicked mm-hmm. with the religion in a way that made it clear that it's not my fault that I quote fell for this stuff. Um, uh-huh. Do you mind speaking on that a little bit? Because I, it, it makes me feel so much better about myself when I hear people say mm-hmm. that I shouldn't feel bad. So I just want to hear it as many times as I can, please. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, you were indoctrinated, right? Did yes. you Did you start out with um, Christianity as a small child? I did. Yes, my uh, Southern Baptist. We were. My dad mm-hmm. was a deacon. Um, and we were in, like this very involved mega church. Yeah. And so, um, so how old were you when you heard about hell? Oh God. Um, you know, it was such a part of our culture. I think probably when I was around four, I think the first time that I quote asked Jesus in my heart, I was probably five or six uh-huh. at the time, you yep, know? Yep, yep. So, um, that was a big thing. But another thing that I noticed too, Marlene, is as I get older, is I'm more of like an empathetic person and I care about healing and being there for people. So I kind of feel like I got sucked into even extra stuff, you know, um, like doing visitation and door to door ministry, mission trips, and committing myself to the ministry and everything. Um, do you see a lot of like, kind of a pattern in the people that are doing retreats with you that kind of what, what kind of common themes are you seeing in their personalities that kind of come out of this garbage? Well, they're usually um, people that are most damaged in general, most damaged by religion are people that were very sincere mm-hmm. about, their, about their faith. That's definitely a pattern we've picked up on. It, um, it meant a lot. You were in it. You were in it all the way, and you you did those extra things. Yeah, you um, you believed, and I was asking you about the, how, how you were as a small child, and you know, a small child doesn't have any defense. A small child will will believe if you teach them well, first of all about Santa Claus and the Tooth Fairy, and this, and at the same age, it'll be it'll be the same. And so you believe in, in God and the story makes sense. And then you grow mm-hmm. up and it's, it stays with you. Um, and you act on it because it means a lot. And mm-hmm. you, can, you can believe in this uh, imaginary friend just like you believe in other imaginary friends. Right, right. So how, how is that your fault? Mm-hmm. And then, then you are very sincerely doing all of these things because um, you, you care deeply. You're the type of personality that that does things that you that you believe in and care about. Hmm. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I just you know ask for a compliment. And I, I just don't know if her. I would like describe Brady as a caring person. Hey, person. no, I'm just kidding. Come on, she doesn't know us yet. I'm just <laughs> right. I am a caring. Per- don't listen to Brady. Well, does, does that fit for you? It, oh, no, absolutely. It does. 100%. Yeah, yeah, it that does. definitely fits. It, it just it fits those- both of us very well. Yeah. You know, one thing that I, I've just found embarrassing as I got older is like how old I was when I stopped believing in a literal, uh, literal tra- like understanding of Noah's Ark. <laughs> like that's sure, like sure. one of the things that I laugh at myself the most. Uh-huh. I'm like, oh, I was way too old to <laughs> not pick up on that. Right, right, right. Yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah. I don't remember how old I was when I stopped believing in Santa Claus, but I know it was too old. Yeah, and it's, it's like a, okay. a kind, yeah. Akin to believe fantastical things now. Mm. Um, so Marlene, uh, so so you have um, in your research, you you have uh, you've emphasized this concept of religious trauma syndrome, right? Which is, mm. am I correct in saying that's a phrase that you coined effectively? Yeah. Okay. Uh-huh. Cool. Um, so there's a like the the word trauma in there. I, I find really. Uh, powerful and interesting in it in it uh is a re- is really essential to um i think the structure of our show and the, yeah. the way that a lot of um our listeners are processing their religious experiences it's understanding trauma but to be honest it's not something that we've talked about a whole lot on the show in any kind of detail so um so we understand the religious in the syndrome but i think there's a lot to know about trauma and i kind of want to pick your brain about that 
Um, so, um, my understanding of trauma, and, and I'm going to just sort of let you have your own definition in this context, but um, we, trauma is like this, it's this very old, um, it stems from this very old brain uh, like reaction to dangerous situations, right? So if like a lizard is being chased by snakes in Planet Earth 2, he is he is responding like that is an, a traumatic experience, and the next time he's in a dangerous situation that involves snakes, his his brain is going to have a different interpretation of how to handle that. Right? He's storing that experience, and then he's like sort of regurgitating it in this weird way, and it's a survival thing, right? But then when yeah. we have these experiences that are painful and hurtful for us emotionally, or or also physically, or or however. Um, in, in, in particularly for our listeners, these church experiences where our humanity is being denied, our childhood is being denied, we're being lied to perpetually, we're being, our, our feelings are being disregarded, all of these things that sort of add up over time results in a kind of trauma, not dissimilar to the lizard running from the snakes, right? Am I right in saying that? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, there's something called a, a amygdala hijack. Mm-hmm. Which, which have you heard of that? I I, I have, but can yeah, go on. Okay. I'm sure well, most people haven't. So, uh, <laughs> I mean, with normal brain processing, you get a stimulus to you get a stimulus to your eyes and ears or mm -hmm. whatever is receiving the information, and it goes through to your your thalamus and processes and and then goes to your prefrontal cortex to mm -hmm. where which is the rational part of your brain right. and then you think about it and then it can go to your muscles to decide what to do right okay the amygdala hijack it turns out uh can can skip the thalamus and go straight to the goes go straight to the amygdala and not and and not bother with the thinking, not bother with the prefrontal cortex, and just go straight to action. Right. Ooh, and just to, to be clear, the amygdala is, is like fight or flight, uh, anger, yeah. aggression, hmm. right. part of that's, the brain. It's a very small little piece of the brain that's like in the middle of, middle of your head. Right. And um, it's responsible for um, all these reactions that yeah. seem, seem like you're not thinking mm -hmm. because you're not. Hmm. So you're just reacting. Right. You're literally bypassing the thinking part. You're just reacting. Right. Hmm. And so then you have these stored memories from doing that that are highly emotional, and they can last a long time. Mm -hmm. So you're, if you have these um, pr pretty much like knee-jerk reactions mm -hmm. to, to where you can get triggered because new information is matching up to these old experiences, and it feels like they're happening again. Mm -hmm. And so that's what's called an amygdala hijack. So it, it's helpful to be aware of what some of those original stimulations were. Right. So, so that you can think about and, and work on what is triggering you and what you're going to do about that when it happens. Right. So you use the word trigger, which is like sort of become a, a, a bit of a... It's... Uh, um, what's the word? Kind Triggering? of a buzz phrase? Oh, yeah. no, no. Kind of a buzz. Yeah, it's... Tr the word triggering is triggering. No, uh, it's kind of a buzz phrase for, uh, especially uh, like younger people these days, and it's it's been uh, it's to the point now where it's sort of being mocked by the political right because you know people are talking about being triggered, and it's sort of viewed as this not very serious thing. But I mean, you're literally describing a physical anatomical reaction, right? That is a literal yeah. thing that happens to humans. Yeah, yeah, because, I mean, you can just Im imagine an overlay, you know, of a matching up of one experience that's matching another that's in your brain, in your memory. Right. And you don't always, you, you don't always know that that's happening, of course. Yeah. You know, this can be totally subconscious. Hmm. And so, when it's, you know, out, totally out of your awareness. Yes. So, uh, can, you d can you describe, like, give me a, an example of... Of things that happen in the in these fundamentalist sort of religious environments that can cause trauma, right? Because I think everybody sort of has an idea, but just to like paint that picture. Oh, I think that a small child that's being told about hell, mm, yeah, that's terrifying. Yeah, you know, and um, mm. and and some people that 
are in homes where hell is emphasized and they, get, they hear about hell all the time. They hear about it at home, they hear about it at school, they hear about it at church, and it's a constant threat, are just constantly terrorized. Mm. Um, yeah. And then as an adult, they're terrified of, of hell, even though they intellectually know that it's not true. They don't believe in it. I have a client that um, just... What, well, he was taught about hell and, and as a as a raging fire, you know, the fire, mm -hmm. lake of fire. Mm -hmm. And so anytime he's around something that's really hot, like if he oh, um, wow. he touched the stove and it was really hot, you know, he suddenly gets terrified. Wow. Because it makes him think that he's going to go to hell. And, that you know, it's been many, many years. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah. That's a very real trigger. Um. It, so we're we're gonna talk a little bit about um, a little bit more about uh, you know tr uh, treatment for religious trauma syndrome a little bit later. But um, if you were to give a, a brief answer for uh, the most effective ways that we've learned to treat trauma in general, or particularly religious trauma, like how would you describe that? Well, um, I think one of the first things is to understand what you're dealing with. You know, um, people tend to think, oh, so you had to go to church, so what? You know, Right, yeah. Com compared to other things, compared to various kinds of abusive things in the home. Uh, otherwise, um, it doesn't seem like any big deal. Hmm. But uh, so you need, you need to learn about what was abusive about it. And that's why I've, I've tried to explain in some of my writing what, um, what the indoctrination of a child really consists of. Hmm. And so you know that that's what you've been through and to um, give, it, give it the credit it deserves. Right. And, then to learn, and then to learn how to take care of yourself so that when some of those, uh, some of those things come up, you can take care of yourself and, and um, go through some of the healing that you need to need to do. Right. I like that. Which in, in this, and, and um, correct me if I'm wrong, in, but in this particular, uh, let's see, in this particular way that trauma manifests itself in the religious world, it affects so many aspects of your life that it can be, can take a really long time to start picking apart the, the individual things that so like I, I guess what i'm saying is like if you are robbed or assaulted on the street and you have trauma as a result of it you know that the trauma comes from that experience right but when you have uh -huh. this ongoing religious thing that is is affecting your life on a daily basis on a minute to minute basis it takes it's a lot more work to, to start parsing out what's what's causing your trauma right well not necessarily okay because um, you know, if, if, for example, well, one of the big things that happens with religious trauma is that you get told that you're not worth anything. Yes. In fact, you're bad and worthless, right? Mm -hmm. And the only way that you're worth anything is, is through, through Jesus, through, through God's redemption. Right. Yeah. Without, without that, you're not worth anything. And you get told that over and over again. Even and so, I mean, one time I I looked at um, some of the songs that are sung and uh, some of the worship tunes that people sing over and over again. Not just the hymns, but some of those worship tunes right. are all, are all about uh, are degrading. They yeah, really degrade. so de self deprecating, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, and um, and and worshiping God as 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 if um, that's the only way to have any value at all, and so. Um, to actually realize that and notice that sometimes it's a big revelation to people. They thought those songs were worship songs. Right, right, right. And yeah. then to realize, no, they're not worship songs. They're they're, they're degrading songs. <laughs> wow, <laughs> right. That's yeah, such a yeah, good yeah. point. Yeah. Self-deprecation songs. It's yeah. such an emphasis on that instead of what it. Um, yeah, that makes so much more sense. Uh, we do need to take a very short break. Yep. Um, when we get back, um, we're going to be back here with Marlene uh, on more on religious trauma syndrome and her book, Leaving the Fold. We'll be right back right after this. Do -do -do. 
There are estimated to be over 630,000 podcasts in the world today. Many of these podcast hosts, producers, writers, and engineers go unpaid for their work, putting in long hours and regular people jobs in order to make ends meet. This is Bill Barnum, the host of Combine Talk with Bill Barnum. Well, you know, we mostly cover the fundamentals of combine machinery, anything from purchasing to maintenance and repair. Each week, we feature a verbal description of our pimped out combine of the week. You know, with sweet flames or American flags or eagles or something. We have a devout audience of about 300. It's more of a community, really. But... In order to keep up with the bills around the house, I have to put in 25 to 30 hours a week at the local Piggly Wiggly. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm grateful for what I have, but I'd really like to focus on my passion someday. Most podcast hosts rely on Patreon accounts for income, strain to generate special content to keep up with the demands of their contributing listeners. This is Megan with an E, a Y, and an H, host of Appropriated Nails on Fleek. So, like, I work so hard, like, every day, scrolling through my IG for, like, hours, finding the best hashtag nail art, hashtag nail art ooh la la, hashtag nail art wow, hashtag nail art swag. I have to search, like, 20 different hashtags, okay? Now I'm saying to get my listeners the content they deserve, and I'm still asking my dad for money, like, twice a week, okay? Now I'm saying... I'm Brady Harden, co-host of The Life After, and I'm here to tell you that for just one or two dollars a month, you can help join the fight against regular people jobs and make it easier for us, your host, to bring you even more of the quality content you love so much. For more information, visit patreon.com slash the life after. That's patreon.com slash the life after and subscribe to donate as little as one or two dollars a month. Make a podcast host dreams come true, because we all need a little second Saturday in our lives. Welcome back. Uh, We are here with uh, Chuck Parson. I'm Brady Harden, and we are with uh, Marlene Marlene Winnell from San Francisco talking to us about religious trauma Do- syndrome. I, should, I, and her... I feel like we should say Dr. Marlene Winnell. I know we should. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Some people like it. Some people <sighs> don't. The, the doctor title. Fine. Can we call you Marlene? Okay, good. Because um, that's how you sign one of your emails, and that's how I always tell. Oh, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. What people I used to work at a, I used to work at a hospital, and so I always get uh, nervous around doctors of any sort. Um, <laughs> so, Chuck, yeah, I did. I wanted to ask you about a piece you wrote. It might have been a, a, a while ago, so I'll try to refresh your memory. But um, it, it's, it was called Why Religious Trauma Syndrome is So Invisible. Is that uh, uh-huh. ringing a bell? Um, so, um, effectively, sort of what you're saying in the piece is that... Um, is that like getting religion is always seen as kind of a positive thing. We have like institutions like AA that you're even sometimes court ordered that are seen as these like net positives, Mm. um, uh, political figures when they are, you know, project themselves as religious or, um, or like on the right, if, if somebody like does something wrong and they repent and sort of, I mean like sort of the whole thing with Donald Trump where like he allegedly became a Christian at some point. So now everything yeah. that he's ever done is fine. You know, Paul, um, so Paul we have White this, told Dr. James Dobson like, that. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. So in society in general, secular or otherwise, it, it seems like finding religion or get, or being religious or being in a religious system is like uh, a, a positive thing regardless. So it's sort of, it's really hard to, kind of convince people that like no actually my my experience is really negative you know Mm. yeah yeah well it's it's like a right people have a right to their religion and it's like a sacred thing and it becomes taboo to talk about it uh it's just assumed that that it's good for you or or at least neutral it can't possibly be be a negative right i think that's what really blew me away about reading your initial article that introduced me into to relig- religious trauma syndrome. And it's something that just finally having the phrase for something, finally having the term religious trauma syndrome, I think just seeing that 
finally gave me permission to tell myself, yeah, that stuff came from the religion. Mm -hmm. Um, It wasn't because I did anything wrong. It's not because I didn't play the game incorrectly, but that trauma actually came from the religion. And I think just having that term was so, uh, so helpful. And I, yeah. And I think that's why so many of our listeners sort of, I mean, how often do we hear like, I feel stupid or I feel duped or I feel like, like, I mean, like you were saying, like I did, I did, I used the system wrong or something. Right. Like, right. Or like it didn't work for me, quote unquote, or, or whatever. And it's like, well, no, I mean, like, it, like our, our culture has this presupposition that we are, that that's like worst case scenario, like doesn't do anything and best hmm. case scenario changes your life, but there's no like Marlene was saying, there's no negative, there's no, right? Yeah. But there's actually a huge negative. So the, sure. so, so naming religious trauma syndrome and then having conversations about it is, could be like a really big shift for our culture. Yeah. And there, and, and also could, if there can be more conversation about it, there can be more, more healing, um, more training of people that are healers, right? more, more literature, more books about it. Um, it could be in the DSM manual and insurance could cover it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Now, I mean, that's absolutely like, it's, um, because, it's kind of a funny mean, point, but it's true. Yeah. Um, because people have, uh, damage, you know, hmm. like even, and, and they're pretty angry too sometimes, like being 35 years old and finally having the courage to leave religion and then realizing that. They've spent years, years um, believing and, and wasting time in their lives and not moving on with career or, you know, having wasted time being a missionary. Right. Um, so that and, anger is normal? That's something that happens often and we shouldn't feel uh, bad about being angry? <laughs> oh, huge anger. Yeah. And, and then feeling feeling guilty as if they're as if they were the ones that wasted all this time. Right. I have this conversation with with people all the time to say, no, it's not your fault. You're, you haven't wasted your life. I like what you said. Uh, this is a quote from uh, your your piece. Recovery recovery is re- as revolution. Sorry, I'm over here. I'm over here nerding out and like stuttering because I, I read all your stuff, but um, you, you said, quote, because Christianity saturates an entire culture, uh, it would be fair to say that the wounds of religious harm belong to everyone, not just the traumatized. So hmm. we're talking about like even something bigger that stems from the pervasiveness of Christianity in American culture, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. What does that, uh, what does that look like? I think like the biggest trauma that I blame Christians for right now is Donald Trump. Uh, but what other, (laughs) what other things did you have in mind that, uh, that we can see as kind of like society's wounds from religion? Well, I don't know. What did I say in that article? (laughs) I'll go back and read it. We'll have a, we'll have a formal reading of the article at the end of the episode. (laughs) I I like that. Well, well, no, no, I, 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 that's an important point. Oh yeah. There's, well, there's there's still this problem of, of self uh, self esteem and self respect in terms of uh, learning to think and and feel for yourself and yeah. taking responsibility. Yeah, I mean, one thing that people don't do is take responsibility for themselves. Mm-hmm. That's partly from the religion, I think. Yeah, you know, mm. to um, actually face reality. I mean, look at what's happening with. Um, climate change deniers right for example right right Um, yeah i mean it's on a big scale where we've got um people trusting our our, trusting authoritarian leaders i mean what's that all about right it's very very dangerous and and they quote scripture to say that we're supposed to trust our leaders right 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 right. yeah particularly jeff sessions (laughs) With that, the border, the kids at the border thing, it was like, uh, well, Romans 13. And that was like a politically like acceptable thing to say to like, uh, you know, a a third of the country. It works for a lot of people. Right, right, right. right. Um, Can you, 
I, I, I am just, your book, Leaving the Fold, was so helpful for me. And it was kind of divided up into three sections that I thought were really helpful. The first section was, you know, sorting it out. Uh, next was healing and growth. Um, first, I wanted to ask you, was sorting it out, that took me so long <laughs> to kind of like finally go through everything that had happened in my life and to make sense with it. Um, can we get kind of just like a two minute crash course on your, on your background and what you, what you kind of had to work out for yourself as a, as somebody who grew up evangelical? Well, I was born into a missionary family. Mm -hmm. So I got your basic indoctrination um, and believed every bit of it. And then as I became a teenager, I was very gung ho as a Jesus freak. Yeah. In, oh, yeah. Both in Taiwan, where they were missionaries. Oh, wow. And I went to a Christian boarding school and was very serious about it there. And then Southern California with the Jesus movement. Oh, um, okay. The yeah. Jesus movement. Oh, yeah, that's a that's an interesting one. <laughs> yeah, we knocked on doors and, and witnessed at the beach, had beach baptisms. It was oh, all very yeah. exciting. Yeah, I bet it was. We were the, the, the Christian version of hippies. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, early versions of Christian rock and roll. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was, it was band. fun. <laughs> um, but then I went to college. Well, actually, I started late, late high school, Was started reading philosophy and um, started to realize that there were other ways of thinking about things. Went to college and uh, just took so many courses that were challenging to the belief system. Yeah. Um, anthropology and history and literature and psychology. Psychology blew me away. Um, Apparently. <laughs> yeah. And... Uh, and then uh, learning about the Bible. You know, you take a, take a course in the Bible as literature, and mm -hmm. uh, that'll change you. Yep, yeah, yeah. And I would say that having the, having the Bible come off its pedestal was one of the biggest things that led to my not believing anymore. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm. Then um, also meeting a lot of people, new people that were secular, that were not crazy or stupid or, uh, or evil. dumb. Evil. Right, or, right. or inherently evil. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, who also had belief systems that were not so bad, you know? Yeah. And I did not feel like witnessing to them. I felt mm. more like listening. Right. Oh, that's such and a good realizing, way, yeah. realizing that Christians don't listen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You mentioned that in your book that your family went as a missionary and it was clear the way you worded it in a book, I thought was interesting. You made it clear that your family was there to change them, not to take in their culture or not to absorb anything back. Right. Right. Well, that's missionaries in general too. Right. Yeah. Very yeah. relatable. Not yeah. open to learning anything. So, um, changing that was pretty refreshing, you know, just to get an open mind and learn things from other people. So I, I've called it a, a matter of pushes and pulls, you know, the, the disappointment with the church and, and the Bible pushing me out. And then the pulls were um, finding new people and new ways of thinking pulling me out. And the combination of that was was pretty powerful. Wow. Because, you, I mean, you'd mentioned you, you were a mission, missionary kid at a boarding school that was Christian. So it seems like that was such a part of your environment. And so finally kind of being exposed to people outside of that environment. Um, when I started to finally do that, that's when I realized that the manipulations that I was being fed about who people are were not true. Cause I was able to see the evidence for myself. Um, but those manipulations and trying to figure out how to, know what's you know what you're being told is whether it's bullshit or not uh is is hard do you have any advice for people that come from my background or for me of like kind of figuring out some of these manipulations and some 
certain things to like look for to see if we're being duped like what well, manipulations f- they come from that are a common in evangelical should evangelicalism should we kind of be looking for the remnants of that might be kind of held over in our personality and our thought life well i think excessive certainty mm-hmm. is one mm-hmm. oh yeah claims to have the truth i mean it's more important to have good questions than good answers right yeah, absolutely. If somebody is provoking you to think more openly, that's great. But to tell you how it is and shutting the conversation down is not a good sign. I like that. That makes sense. That helps me because um, with the cal- Calvinistic background that I had, um, our leader spoke with very clear certainty. Right. You know, because that was such an emphasis that we had was to take everything so literal that we could feel very concrete and very um, certain about abstract things. And so that was kind of how they talked. And if we didn't get in on that with them, there was an element of feeling lesser than or not as committed, not as uh, faithful to what they were saying. So they kind of encouraged us to also be kind of more certain in how we talked and very, you know, this is how it is and this is what we believe and this is what's important, you know? So we kind of like created the problem, you know, that we should have been the solution to and it just kind of became more of a synergetic issue. I feel like. Well, Hmm. it's interesting that um, there are some things that I would call leftovers Hmm. when you are an ex Christian and you don't believe it anymore. You've, you've let go of the dogma but you still have some of the behaviors, like you still have black and white thinking, or you still have this uh, certainty about everything, right. or, or you're very judgmental. You can have these leftover ways of thinking that are, are still true and still need some work. And you may not notice that for a while. Mm-hmm. Hmm. I noticed my, my black and white thinking has taken me a, a, a long time to recognize and see what it is you know because I, I have a tendency of going from one extreme to another um, either religion was the best thing or it was the absolute worst thing but you know time now I, I'm able to kind of pull out the good and and get rid of the bad um, but yeah that black and white thinking that takes a while to, to kind of get out of that, that's a deep pit to have to crawl yourself out of uh-huh. mm-hmm. and the urge the urge to be right yes right I'm bad at that Oh God. Oh God. I'm bad at that. (laughs) You, uh, you talk about in your book, you talk about the thought monster. Um, I feel like that kind of, uh, that kind of falls under this category and kind of doesn't, but, um, can you briefly describe what the, what the, what the thought monster is and, and, uh, I guess what, how do we, how do we combat it? Oh, the idea monster. Idea monster. Sorry. Yeah. It's a theoretical construct. Uh um, it's 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 um, not an actual a, monster. No, you don't have an actual <laughs> monster. <either. laughs> it's this collection of ideas that you have that um, came from whatever source. It could come from society or or school or family or church. And a lot of them, in this case, would come from church, from religion. And it might be things like you're not good enough, or you're in trouble or you're going to go to hell. It could be any number of Mm -hmm. ideas, but they kind of coalesce into this collection that is very good at haunting you and beating you up in a lot of situations. And so it's important to uh, clarify what those ideas are, and there's some exercises in the book for for doing that, because once you clarify what some of them are, it's it's easier to not believe them, because the problem is when you believe them, Mm-hmm. So if you clarify them and, and, and look at them more clearly, then when when you're being attacked by the monster, you can stop everything and say, oh, there it is again. Right. That's huge. And, and stop the progress. So one of the things that we have been focusing a lot on this season is um, we've, we have found that um, a lot of our listeners and a lot of people that are in uh, our situation where they're they're trying to recover from religious trauma um, sort of get hung up, right? They get they get to this point where like they're they're comfortable 
um, acknowledging that this was a this was a bad thing that happened to me. They're comfortable leaving the religion. Um, they're comfortable, you know, sort of like, as, you know, f- living a life that's separate from what happened. Um, but I, I, I feel like a lot of people kind of get stuck there, right? So like you're out, but you're not, but the, the steps that you have to take after you're out to continue to, um, to continue to grow, to continue to heal, um, to, to begin to form your own, um, path, I guess, uh, to, to start a fresh life, right? I, in your book, you call it get a life right? It's, this is where you start to rebuild. I like that. Um, and we're, we're really trying to focus on that uh, in this season of the show. Um, what, what, are some, uh, what are some points that you would, some advice you would give our listeners for starting fresh? Basically, the religion defines everything about your life. It defines who you are. It defines who other people are to you. It defines uh, what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to be um, following God's will. It defines what the world is, what the future is, right? It just basically has definitions for everything. Mm -hmm. So if you leave all that behind, you're really needing to start over and and reconstruct. And so this reconstruction is is very deep and very thorough. Uh, You're reconstructing your own identity, your own... Um, pattern of relationships, your own um, sense of mean, your own meaning in life, and all of it. So, if you haven't really thought about all of those different things, then um, you can you can still be following through on some of the things that you thought were important in your life. Right. So, you really have to look at your values all over again. One value that has been kind of a guiding light for me was to be the adult that I needed as a kid. Um, mm. uh, that, that old phrase has kind of like become like almost a, a pillar in rebuilding who I am. And when we, when I was reading through your book, you had an entire, you know, chapter and section on the inner child. And that mm-hmm. spoke to me so much because, you know, the idea with the inner child is to kind of think of the things that, uh, fundamentalism hurt you as a child and then kind of gently and um, lovingly address those things to yourself. And that was kind of a weird practice for me for a little bit, Marlene, because, uh, you know, we hear the inner child thing and it sounds like a hokey idea almost, but um, that was so helpful for me and really put a lot of things in perspective. And it spoke to something that was kind of one of my core pillars anyway. Um, can you speak on the inner child and kind of how that um, sort of exercise looks? Yeah, well, um, first of all, it's it's quite okay to think of the self in parts, okay? Mm. there, and, and sometimes it's called parts work. Okay. Um, you have, and, and, and people in casual conversation will say things like, Part of me thinks this, and part of me thinks that, or I beat myself up, or I'm my own best friend, or th- things like that, uh-huh. to where you, you have some awareness of parts. Okay, so so what this do- using these concepts is just a a um, productive way of doing it, a conscious way of doing it, and so the inner child is representative of something. It's, it it represents the part of you that is childlike, and mm. you relate to that because a child uh, more, very obviously represents innocence and, and playfulness and vulnerability and all these things that we know about children and you still have that in you. So there's that part of you that, that needs to be cared for. Now, in some frameworks, they will just talk about getting in touch with your inner child and leave it at that which I think is only half of the story. I think you have to have your inner adult also. Okay. Mm. Because the inner adult is the part of you that is like the wise man or the wise woman. Mm -hmm. You know, the one who can care for and provide guidance for that child, love Mm. that child, okay, and take care of that child in in a lot of situations and be the advocate when the Mm. child needs something. To, to get it, mm. to negotiate with the world and mm-hmm. get things 
for the child. If the child is, is lonely, to, to understand that and try to find friends. If the child is bored, look for things to do. Hmm. You know? To, to understand the child's needs. The, the, so the child is has feelings and needs, and the adult has skills for negotiating and the negotiating with the world and getting those needs met. I love that. In a rash, in a so it's like the feeler and the thinker. And so, cool. and so many things were neglected for people who grew up in fundamentalism. Like right, I was going to say. Places that we should have had like loving kindness. You know, there's this... Uh, damage that happens. What were you going to say, Chuck? Yeah, uh, I mean, I was, I was just going to say, like, fundamentalism sort of is, is, is actually aimed at exploiting that inner child, right? I mean, like, that's yeah. we sort of have God as the father. Um, we have like God provides everything. We have, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. the The religion infantilizes you. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's a good way to so, put that. Yeah, that's a very good way so to put it. You outsource the job of the adult. You outsource uh -huh. it to where, you know, the, the, the church, the religion, God, you pray to God when you need something instead of relating internally to yourself and, mm -hmm. and taking care of yourself and taking responsibility. Uh -huh. So you're oh. avoiding responsibility. Mm -hmm. That's why a lot of people, when they leave, they're unused to the self-care that's necessary. Or how to do your taxes. Uh, that was a thing that I messed up a couple of times. <laughs> um, a, a thing that I've been finding so helpful is being a dad because, you know, my son, he's six right now. And so I'm, I have him half time uh, and I'm, I'm raising him. And my kid is just a carbon copy of myself. It's disgusting. Like, it's like somebody cloned me and just threw another six-year-old Brady into the world and now that's my child like he stopped by over here at Chuck's house the other day and it's like he's me right yeah he's literally a tiny Brady so me and so I'm getting this opportunity as a parent to reflect on what I needed as a kid my inner child and how that wasn't fed by uh, fundamentalism I'm able to now be my son's advocate to the world, make sure that he's getting the things that I didn't. But um, the, the synergetic thing on the side too is watching him is like now watching myself grow up. And so I'm able to kind of reflect on my life through his life. Um, I hope that's a healthy thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. I think I think um, people that have children have a great advantage because you can learn from that and and to parent your own inner child. Is that what's happening? Yes, I mean absolutely. <laughs> I, I just I've learned so much from myself from watching my kid, and I learned so much about my kid from watching myself, and yeah. um, it's been so good for me. Um, Oh, I'm not going to cry talking about parenthood, but, um, yeah, I mean, he, uh, just after I left religion and was divorced and disfellowshipped and everything, and kind of lost a lot of my family relationships. My son was there, um, but it was so scary because I didn't know how to do it on my own and I couldn't outsource it to anybody else. It was just me. And so, uh, I don't know, just now getting to the point of watching him get to an age where he's able to think and process things and discuss things has been uh, so different for me um, and to kind of provide an emotional stability that wasn't there for me in the fundamentalism background because my, my, my parents didn't really do that self-reflection that um, I feel my son is benefiting from his parents doing now. Um, and I don't know, parenting is so weird now. Uh, you know, parenting as, as a fundamentalist is kind of, you, you have a guide of what you should do, whatever, but parenting now, um, I don't know. Can you, can, can you give us some, some parenting advice or something, Marlene? I feel like you've got some good things to say about parenting and I yeah, hope you I have can enlighten us. Yeah, I have a lot to say us. about parenting, but, yes. um, the first thing is that in the church context, the church actually usurps the role of parent. Mm. They, they tell you all these things about what you should do as a parent. Um, and, and there are whole books and agencies like, like um, Focus on the Family and Dobson. 
Right. right. Oh, God. Who's that again? I haven't heard of him. I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's a joke. He raised me. He did, you know, Marlene, you want to hear something really weird? When my parents got divorced, I got sent to a Dr. James Dobson focus on the family basketball camp for kids who have divorced parents. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it the strangest thing? Like, it's so niche. Oh. It's disgusting. Like, who comes up with this shit? And I won most Christ like out of my team which means there. that he's really bad at basketball really wow. bad at basketball but very good at turning the other cheek i didn't know i didn't know jesus played basketball <laughs> so so anyway um what that does is it doesn't um it doesn't trust the parents to use their own uh intuitive mm. ideas for mm-hmm. trust for for parenting kids, it doesn't trust them to to do that, and uh, that's really too bad because a lot of parents do have plenty of intuition about how to be good parents, right? Um, yeah, right. Yeah, and and the church just gets really gets in between the parent and child. Right. Yes. I think that's really terrible. Yeah. 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 <laughs> the last the last church that I went to, um, they put such an emphasis on on spanking. Um, you know, of course, they would always go back to the spare the rod thing uh, to the point where uh, somebody spanked one of my friend's kids in the nursery without consent. And it became this big thing. My my friends left the church because and I look back at I'm like. I would have done that in a heartbeat too. I would have left that place. Like knowing what I know now, uh, yeah. that somebody would have taken upon themselves to use corporal punishment on that. That's just right. uh, insane to me. Insane to me. But, um, the other thing is that, um, aside from, aside from the church usurping, um, there's a whole different, uh, view of human beings that you have when you're a secular parent. And that is that you assume that people are basically basically good and are not in need of punishment all the time in order mm. to control them. Mm, the, mm-hmm. the, the, the Christ, I'll just say the Christian parent is constantly trying to raise a child uh, in a way that's controlling yes. you know, to, and is afraid of the, of the child doing bad things. Right. Mm-hmm. So there's this constant emphasis on uh, obedience. Everything has to do with obedience. Your, trust um, and obey. Trust and obey. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So um, when the child grows up, they will they will know how to do things right because you taught them. So there's that. What's that verse? Uh, raise uh, the child the way he will go God, and will, not yeah. depart from it. Yes. And so it's a very heavy responsibility on the parents' part. It's like the parent's responsibility to raise a child in this way. And then if, if you fail, if the child leaves Christianity, say, it's the parent's fault. Right. Yes. That's why um, I think people need to remember this when they're coming out to their parents. Oh, that the parents, right. That, that the parent is going to feel at fault. Yes. Yeah. Not, mm. just, not just sad. Yeah. That's a good point because, in addition to that, too, the the era that I grew up in, they put such an emphasis on if you're gay, it's because you had an overbearing mother, right? Or you oh. had an, uh, you know, a non ex or a father who's non-existent or not in the picture that much, or you didn't have enough good Christian guy friends. Uh, those were the emphasis that were put on 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 to me, and I know that I've had to have a conversation with my mom before, just saying straight up, this is not your fault. Um, yeah. But then it kind of it still goes into uh, a kind of a diagnosis mode for her diagnostic mode. I mean, where it's kind of like, well, we need to figure out, well, why, you know, or why are you this way? And uh, no, it's not a thing that needs to be fixed. So there's not a problem. But um, in that mindset, they, they do believe that they do have that that thing. And so it's kind of a shitty situation to come out and then automatically um, just the existence of being alive, somebody looks at as a failure on their part, right. you know, of me living my true self means that they had to have failed in a religion. Right. Plus I had to have failed at the religion. Um, 
and there's just no hope for gay people coming out of fundamentalism when it comes to so making the, sense of it, at least. So, so the contrast for uh, a non-Christian upbringing or, or a humanistic upbringing mm-hmm. is is huge. In that, if you're if you are trusting your child, trusting your child to grow up to be. Uh, a full-fledged human being and, and creative and uh, able to do all kinds of things. What mm-hmm. you do is you, you feed that ability, you nurture that creativity, and you're not afraid. You're not afraid for your child to be exposed to things or to think all kinds of things, you're not, and you're not afraid of what that child is going to become. Mm, but um, you support your child. Which is, like, not a concept in, like, supporting your child is almost, like, my fundamentalist brain has, like, negative connotations with that. Because that's, like, well, your child is bad, and if you support them, you're supporting them being bad. You should discipline your children. And that's how you show support, right? Uh, So, you know what I'm hearing in all of this is, like, it goes back to what Marlene said earlier about personal responsibility, because... We have this system where, especially if you're raised in church, which, like, our generation, I really feel like, has a unique experience of being raised in church because we were the first generation to have, like, a really intense youth culture that was separate from the rest of the church My culture. My mom's, though, I, I get a weird sense that there was something else going on to before us like in the in the 70s maybe that, well that was the jesus movement but oh that's okay that's and, what i'm getting um, okay. anyway my point is like you have like parents are responsible for their kids behavior right mm-hmm. and then god is responsible for the parents behavior well so if you're an adult you're you're like in this weird <laughs> in between space where like you're, we're like everything's your fault and nothing is your fault y- yeah yes <laughs> it's right. insane yes yes <laughs> yeah god takes no responsibility for his children i'll just be the first to say that <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> but I, I don't know i'm just i feel lucky um just going back to being a parent because i i'm getting to learn how to treat myself at the same time that i'm learning to treat him um and i think that's something that i hope some of our listeners will get to that uh nurture that and take responsibility to nurture yourself and to not feel because i always felt selfish right marlene i mean that's like the the other shitty thing about all of this is um the things that the things that would help us were kind of demonized whether that's counseling, self improvement books, um, anything like that, it just seems like an understanding of fundamental self-esteem. psychology. Mm, <laughs> yeah, yeah self esteem, not hating yourself, right? <laughs> right, like um, psychology. Um, Ooh, yeah, yeah, right. This is this is actually a really good segue. We need to take a break, but I do want to ask uh, Marlene when we get back about um, sort of the juxtaposition of. Uh, how psychology views the world versus how fundamentalism does. So we can get into that and we'll be back right after this. If you were going to die tonight, do you know where Stop. you Stop. Would... Just tell them about our website. Oh, just tell them to go to the lifeafter.org. Yes, they can go now, even without accepting Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. <laughs> the lifeafter.org. We have a blog contact page, a link to our Facebook page. And more. All right. Thelifeafter.org. Heavenly. Welcome back, everybody. And we're back. Um, Marlene, so um, one of the things that has uh, been really interesting to me, so I guess I, I'm in the process of trying to, I'm, I'm still, I would say I'm, I'm a little bit further down, down the road than a lot of the, the, people that come from this this uh background that that i encounter in a lot of ways but um i'm still sorting through um a lot of the differences between having been raised in a in a non-religious non-fundamentalist setting versus 
having been raised in one or having mm-hmm. having not been raised in one versus having been raised in one and and the way that that still affects me which is sort of what we've been talking about the whole show um but one of the one of the biggest things that we have talked about a couple of times on the show but not in a lot of great detail is this sort of juxtaposition between um when you have when you grow up fundamentalist the the, the starting point is you are bad and you are in need of a savior and God, so you sort of passively accept your salvation and God actively improves you as a person, right? But the, 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 what, I'm, what I'm finding about, about psychology, and this is like, you're so familiar with both worlds that this is, I think, a really good question for you, is that psychology starts with the premise that you are a good person, if and and there's and if if you don't start with that premise in the psychological world you really don't have anywhere to go you have to start with you are a good person let's figure out x y and z that will like what what will heal you what will what fix you yeah. yeah what what can you do pa- actively um to improve your situation right so um can you can you comment on that at all? Like that that how important that difference is, and, and how much that impacts uh, the way we perceive ourselves. Yeah, it has to um, grow and change and heal. You have to think well of yourself, and a therapist can help you do that by thinking well of you. If you go to get help, you can trust that process. Mm-hmm. It's a lot about trust and trusting yourself to tell your story. It's healing to tell your story. It's not going to make things worse. Right. Uh, sometimes people think that if they talk about it, it's going to make it worse. Mm. And that's not true. Um, you don't have to tell a, a, a happy story. You just tell your story. And, and a story that's coherent and makes sense will help you put it in place and know more about what you're dealing with and a direction that you can take and get support in that process. It implies it, an, an inherent value to the human life and to the idea of healing in the first place, right? Because all of that is undervalued in, in, in fundamentalism because the goal is not, the goal is not to, to, <laughs> the goal is to serve God, right? The goal is not to make to improve your personal situation. Mm-hmm. It's not to be happy. It's not to. It's like there's a lot of talk about healing, but the the point is not really healing. You right? you have to convince yourself first that you're worthy of healing. That I mean that that that's even that you have enough value to want to be better. Uh, and that was such a huge step for people to even take that first step to do something for themselves because that that's so anti Calvinist. That's so anti Christian of what we were brought up with. Mm-hmm. Ugh, I hate it. It was so backwards. Um, before we go, I want to touch on a couple of things. Uh, first, uh, what symptoms of religious trauma syndrome should people be looking out for? in their lives? Like what, what are some of the symptoms that uh, you notice that are common with the people that are coming into your retreats? Oh, oh, the, the full range. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> anxiety and depression, guilt, um, problems with sexuality. That's a mm. big one. Yep. Never had that. I've never had <laughs> any problems with any um, sexuality ever. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's a joke. Uh, Problems with uh, relationships, like um, coming out to parents and other people. Uh, isolation, right? Big one. My cognitive... Oh, I was messed up for a while. I couldn't think straight. Whew. <laughs> so, um, so, Marlene... Finding meaning, meaning in life. Oh, yeah. Mean, yeah. Struggling with meaninglessness. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. That was... That took a year and a half for me to figure out. I think so, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, Marlene, thanks so much for being on the show. Um, wh- you have you have two retreats coming up, and they're fundamentally different, right? Can you um, fundamentally <laughs> fundamentally? Di- <laughs> can you describe? They are basically different. <laughs> can you describe? Um, um, w- well, first of all, when they are, so people know when it's happening, and also what the what the uh, difference between the two is. 
Okay, one is kind of the introductory basic retreat, and it's May 17th to 20th, and um, it's basically focused on personal healing, mm. I- identity, and self-esteem, um, and also relationships with others. Um, we do a lot of storytelling and uh, exercises around healing the, the self and developing the identity. Cool. Very the cool. The second one is um, May 24th to the 27th, and that one has more to do with um, sexuality and meaning in life. Oh, man, I might need to fly off for that one. <laughs> yeah, and more on relationships. Very cool. Beautiful. And these are in the uh, Bay Area? Uh, yeah, in San Francisco. In San Francisco. Very cool. And uh, our listeners can find more information at journeyfree.org. Yep. Yeah. Uh, which also you have a lot of you have a lot of writing up on there. Um, you do some blogging and some updating on that uh, fairly regularly. Um, and I uh, yeah. And you also do you you call yourself a, a human development consultant, right? So are you taking clients or is that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, you can find out more about that on the website. Very cool. Awesome. Well, Marlene, thank you so, so much. Yes. There's, okay. an online, um, there's an online support group, by the way. It's a oh. private support group. You have to uh, have a password. It's, uh, oh, okay. Ooh. Yeah, uh, because it's um, it's like a therapy group, actually. It's, it's uh, facilitated by me. Oh, very we have, cool. We have online uh, What's conference the calls twice a month. What's the password, McLean? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus is Lord. You get your own password. Right. Oh, wow. Uh, so how do people find that if that's something they're interested in? Well, go go to the website and um, you, you book an appointment with me, a 20-minute free appointment, and then we'll talk and see if it's appropriate for you to join the, the group. Okay. Awesome. Then Very cool. Go from there. Awesome. Yeah, I know that'd be really beneficial. I know one of our pre- previous uh, guests, Andrew uh, Jasko, has gone to one of your retreats. I don't know if I'm saying oh, cool. his last name correctly. Yeah, I think so. uh, but yeah, he's great. He highly recommends the retreats. I know they've been really beneficial for him and a lot of people. But um, yeah, listeners, I cannot emphasis, emphasize this enough. Please define these things for you figure out what religious trauma syndrome is what it means pick up a copy of leaving the fold oh god yes please read leaving also the fold. available on kindle which is how i read it yeah or, um i have it on kindle and a paperback ah, version doubling up doubling up um but it's so beneficial and so helpful for me brought a lot of growth and a lot of healing um and i cannot recommend it enough so marlene thank you again Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for everything, um, <laughs> for writing that book and writing those articles and inspiring this podcast. Because if I wouldn't have read that article that Jamie posted about religious trauma syndrome, um, I would probably still be wandering around like a Israelite <laughs> in the desert. Oh God, Ew. trigger warning. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> anyway. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marlene. And listeners, remember, uh, we have a Patreon page. Please rate, review, and subscribe. Uh, On iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcast. And remember, if you you don't don't go go to to church, church, Sunday Sunday is just just the second second Saturday. Saturday. We'll see you next time. (laughs) 